Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Holson. In this law session, which is consists of four segments, we will consider the contract law area of frustration. Now, we have already seen in the previous law session relating to performance and breach that a contract may be discharged by uh, agreement, that it may be discharged by performance or indeed breach. Well, this session, for the next hour or so, we will certainly be looking at discharge by frustration. Now, a contract may be frustrated where there exists a, a change in circumstances after the contract was made, which is not the fault of either party. And it is such that it renders the contract either impossible to perform or it deprives the contract of its commercial purpose. Now, where a contract is found to be frustrated, each party is discharged from future obligations under the contract and neither party may sue for breach. The allocation of loss is decided by the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act of 1943. Now, it was a completely different case, of course, prior to the Act, because we see that the way the common law developed was that it was completely onerous and very difficult on a party in circumstances where an event which occurred after the making of the contract had developed, which significantly adversely impacted on the contract. Now, a thought to bear in mind in going to this session is to consider that when you look at frustration, frustration is at times contrasted with mistake simply because with mistake you look at events which may have occurred prior to the contract, but with frustration, you are looking at situations and events which have occurred after the contract is made and impacts on the contract. Now, for the distinction between frustration and a common mistake, the court that would be, the case that would be relevant would be Amalgamated Investment and Property Company and John Walker and Sons Limited. But certainly it provides that when you're looking at the two, frustration looks at a cause affecting the contract after it's made, mistake looks at a cause affecting the contract before it's made. So frustration occurs where it is established that due to subsequent change in circumstances, the contract has become impossible to perform or again, that it's been deprived of its commercial purpose. Now, the test for frustration is whether there has been a radical change in the obligation. The doctrine is often called subsequent or supervening impossibility, and its effect is that the parties are released from their contractual obligations, and that therefore ends any kind of obligations they have under it. Now, as it relates to how frustration has developed, well, up until the 19th century, the common law adopted a doctrine of absolute obligation to perform a contract. And so in the case of Paradine and Jane, a 1647 case, a tenant was sued for arrears of rent. And in defense, the tenant pleaded that for the last three years, he had been dispossessed of his farm by the king's enemies. The court rejected his plea and the tenant was liable for the rent, even though he was unable to take the benefit of the lease. The effect of this was mitigated subsequently by the case of Taylor and Caldwell in 1863, where Justice Blackburn in the case formulated the basic principle of frustration. Now, clearly, it is going to be onerous. The fact is, when you look at it, the common law, and this is one of the reasons when you look at the rise of equity, it certainly was necessary because the common law can be very strict because certainty was certainly at the heart of it as opposed to any sort of fairness and justice because in the case, it really would have been a little bit unfair, but notwithstanding. Well, in Taylor and Caldwell, which is an 1863 case, the claimant had hired out a music hall in Surrey for the purpose of holding four grand concerts. Now, the claimant went to great expense and effort in organizing the concerts. Of course, you can imagine, you know, advertising, making sure that it is uh, prepared and all the rest of it. Um, no, no less rehearsals and all that sort of thing. But a week before the first concert was due to take place, the music hall was destroyed accidentally in a fire. Now, the claimant sought to bring an action for breach of contract for failing to provide the hall 
and he claimed damages for the expenses incurred. Now, the court held that the claimant's action for breach of contract had to fail. They said the contract had been frustrated as the fire meant that the contract was impossible to perform. Now, the doctrine has been given certainly some strength in the cases of Davis Contractors Limited and Fearham Urban District Council, 1956, and also in National Carriers Limited and Panalpina, which is 1981. And in fact, in the Panalpina case, the court there said frustration of a contract takes place when there supervenes an event without default of either party and for which the contract makes no sufficient provision, which so significantly changes the nature, not just the expense or onerousness, of the outstanding contractual rights and or obligations from that which the parties could reasonably have contemplated at the time of its execution that it would be unjust to hold them to the literal sense of its stipulations in the new circumstances. In such a case, it said, the law declares both parties to be discharged from further performance. Clearly, we see a more equitable and gentler nature coming through in the Taylor decision. And so, of course, it seems a mitigation of the harshness of the common law rule. Well, the circumstances in which tr frustration may occur, of course, are where the subject matter or a vital external element of the contract has been destroyed. Case in point, of course, is the Taylor and Caldwell case, which we just mentioned. Also, frustration has now been encapsulated in statute under Section 7 of the Sale of Goods Act 1979, which provides a, a statutory basis uh, similar to the common law basis now to say that where, of course, there is some uh, event which then causes a frustration of the contract, then the parties will be, of course, discharged from their obligations. There is, of course, an interesting case which draws a contrast, and you can look at that uh, at your leisure. It's Blackhorn, Bobbin and Company and Allen. Now, in circumstances where there is unavailable or interruption, there may also be uh, a frustration. And the case for that, which we will come back to uh, at a later uh, segment, is BP Exploration Libya Limited and Hunt. Now, death or personal incapacity of a party to a contract as it relates to personal service will operate generally to render the contract frustrated. The case in point is Condren Baron Knights, a 66 case where a 16 year old agreed by contract to play the drums for the defendant band for seven nights for, per week for five years. Now the claimant suffered a mental breakdown and was told by his doctor that he should not perform more than four nights per week. The band dismissed him and he brought a claim for wrongful dismissal. Well, the court said that his action had to fail as his medical condition made it impossible for him to perform his contractual obligations and the contract was therefore frustrated. Of course, you can look for a contrast in the Mount and Oldham Corporation case in 1973 and certainly as you're doing that, you can look at the effects of illness or imprisonment when you look at the context of employment contracts. Because the question is, does the fact that you are imprisoned means that your employment contract is frustrated? Well, have a look at the Mountain Oldham Corporation case, and I hope that gives you some degree of um, titillation there to have a look at it. Now, where the contract becomes illegal to perform, it will frustrate the contract as well. The case, of course, is the Fibrosa Spalka case uh, and Fairburn in 1943. This was where an English company uh, who manufactured textile machinery agreed by contract dated the 12th of July 1939 to supply some machines to a Polish company. The machines were to be delivered in three to four months. Now, £1,600 was payable up front and the balance of £3,200 was payable on delivery. Now, the Polish company paid £1,000 on the 18th of July on account of the initial payment due. On the 1st of September, Germany invaded Poland, rest is history, 
and on the 3rd of September, Great Britain declared war on Germany, while on the 23rd of September, orders in council made Poland an enemy territory, making it illegal for British companies to trade with Poland. Now, the court said that the contract was frustrated as it was no longer possible to perform the contract because of the supervening illegality because had you had he tried to carry out the company tried to carry out the contract then obviously they would have been trading with the enemy which would undoubtedly have been an illegal state of affairs now contract will be frustrated where it cannot be performed in the specified manner and the case in point of course is Avery and Bowden in 1903 in the case and by contract the claimant was to carry cargo for the defendant now the claimant arrived early to collect the cargo and the defendant told them to wait and we've raised this in uh, our previous case but in our previous session but certainly for our purposes I will certainly go over it because in the case they told them uh, that they would wait for the cargo now it wasn't ready by the agreed date now the claimant decided to wait around in the hope that the defendant would be able to supply some cargo but before the date the cargo was supposed to be shipped there was a Crimean war broke out it meant the contract became frustrated now the claimant lost the right to sue for breach not least because of his hanging around now those are the situations that we would look at in relation to making it illegal for example we are of course going to take a very short break and when we return we will carry on with the circumstances in which a contract will be considered frustrated, meaning it will, be, have not, it will have now become impossible to perform. <laughs> 